your podcast and YouTube blog covering the German startup scene with news, interviews, and live events. Hello and welcome, everybody. This is Joe from Startup.io, your startup podcast, YouTube blog, and internet radio station from Germany. Today, I do have a cannabis entrepreneur here with me. Hey, Philip, how you doing? Hi, Joe. Uh, nice to meet you, and thanks for having me. If either he or I sound a little bit tired, it's because the Super Bowl went into overtime and we didn't get enough sleep last night. We already cleared this out. Um, nonetheless, Philip, welcome very much. You are the CEO and co-founder of Contourage. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm the CEO of Kantaraj, um, but I'm, I'm not one of the founders. I actually was founded by two close friends of mine, and I joined the party in January 2021. Uh, the company was originally founded in 2019, uh, but yeah, I joined a bit later, and here we are. Here we are. Um, talking about you, I've seen you did some pretty interesting stuff in your life, including a stay at the University of Sydney. How did you like your time back there? Yeah, that was uh, back in the heydays. It was uh, lots of fun. Um, yeah, it's a beautiful city. It was lots of fun being there. Unfortunately, I just spent a semester there and then I had to go back to Germany, but uh, it was fun times, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. I've seen you then became a consultant for more than eight years. And then the, 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 there is a break in your uh, CV that I really find interesting because from associate principal in a consulting company, you jumped ship and became the manager director of Aurora Deutschland GmbH, which is also in cannabis business. And then you went on to manage Contourage. But can you tell me, how did you go from consulting to cannabis? Uh, sure. Um, so I did consulting for, for quite some time. I uh, was may maybe on a track to at some point become a partner. Um, but I wasn't having too much fun in the end, to being quite quite honest there. Um, so the, 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 the consulting company I worked for was founded by a couple of McKinsey partners. Um, And those, those guys actually also become mentors of mine. And uh, when I um, talk to them quite openly that I like to do something else, um, they basically said, um, I, I should, I should reach out to people in the startup industry in Berlin because, um, they saw potential in me in order to, to build a company. Um, and lucky me, they reached out to um, a former colleague of theirs, uh, Florian Holzapfel, um, who was one of the founders of Pedanius, which later become Aurora, which was the first cannabis wholesale in Europe. Uh, and initially it was just to meet them, uh, to better understand the startup scene. Uh, and then we had a chat for a few hours and then basically offered me a job at his company. Uh, and uh, lucky me, um, yeah, I soon became then also the managing director or the CEO of Aurora, actually also Aurora Europe which was quite the right. It was in, in the early stages of the cannabis industry in Europe, um, Aurora, which was at that point in time, one of the largest, if not the largest cannabis company in the world. And I was um, tasked to build a European platform. It was uh, quite the right, it was quite challenging, but also a huge success, at least from our perspective, um, to build a company from 30 employees to more than 250 in a few years, uh, together with the team, we also won the tender to cultivate cannabis in Germany. So lots and lots of experiences, um, which also now helps me in order to further build another cannabis company, um, Cantorage, which is now also one of the, if not the market leader in Europe for cannabis. Let's talk about Cantorage here, the company you are heading as CEO, because there are many things different here. And I would like to talk about that because first, you are not the necessarily privately held VC funded startup we usually have here. Can you talk a little bit about that? And what decision made you do it differently? Um, 
Yeah, so we went public in November 2022. Um, um, at the end of the day, we thought um, there is there are, not, there are not a lot of opportunities for private investors uh, to invest into a hot topic like cannabis. Um, there's just a, a few listed companies in Europe. And uh, we thought uh, we'd like to give um, uh, investors the opportunity to invest into cannabis um, rather early and also to invest into a growing company like Kantaraj uh, rather early. Uh, also, um, I just mentioned that the, the, um, that the founders of Kantaraj, they um, sold their, their first business to Aurora. Um, they saw what happens if you're um, acquired by a larger company. And this time around, uh, we, we'd love to do it differently, uh, being at the, the driver wheel for the foreseeable future. Um, so even though we went public, um, the founders, the management team, we still own uh, over 75, 80% of the company. Um, so we like to be, be, be public in order to have, let's say, ample opportunities to grow in the future, to raise capital uh, while remaining in, in the driver's seat, not being under the gun of um, um, outside or external investors. I understand that this also gives you access to those capital markets, debt and equity, which should be a big bonus. But on the other hand, you also have to very regularly publish all your numbers, which is usually something the startups don't like to do. How, how does, does this feel for you right now? Um, I mean, it's, 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 it's an additional layer. It's an additional layer of complexity, um, so far. Um, so, so far, so far, so good, I'd say. And it also helps to professionalize your company at the end of the day. Uh, so we, um, we publish, um, our numbers, our figures on a regular basis. Uh, we streamline our processes in order to get there. So at the end of the day, it also makes you uh, further develop the company to further mature. Um, and, yeah, um, I mean, and also, especially looking at our numbers, I feel quite, um, quite good in, in order to publish these, because uh, compared to our peers, I think we're doing not too bad. Um, so we feel, um, I mean, it's good to have that transparency and, and then to show the world what we are, what we are about. Um, and <laughs> like, given that we've been successful so far, um, I have no trouble talking openly about what we do. There's no need to keep it secret or private. Um, Yeah, we're out there in the open and talk openly about what we do, where we're successful and where we're not successful. So, um, so far, so good, I would, I'd say. Yeah. I would be interested when you talked about that. There are a lot of capital market events around Germany, around the world. When you are there, are you in the ugly kids corner or are you really approached by investors who are interested how the cannabis business is developing? What, 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 What's the feel like there on the event? Um, but it, it depends. And it's also evolving over time, uh, I think. So the first time around, we went to the um, Eigenkapital Forum in Frankfurt in November or November, December 2022. And we were the, I mean, the odd kids, uh, and maybe the ugly kids in the corner because nobody has heard, of, heard about us. And cannabis was something rather new. Um, and... The, the, the discussions were mainly around what is cannabis, what is medical cannabis, uh, what's the regulation like. So we didn't really talk about counter rush. It was more about educating uh, potential investors about cannabis in general. Um, but I think the last couple of couple of years that has somewhat changed and evolved. You could can sense that um, uh, investors also did their homework. And they're asking more precise questions about cannabis or specifically about counterage, our, our past performance and then future potential. Uh, you can see that, um, um, some investors, not all of them are really interested in cannabis. Um, and also if, uh, let's say do in depth analysis of, of the market, the competitive landscape and asking uh, good questions these days. Uh, it's not broad about cannabis. So it's, it's, it's more fun for me. Um, And we can see that uh, more people are um, interested in investing in, in cannabis also from an institutional uh, perspective. Talking about education here, we, we've really grown massively since we had the likes of Finn Henselow with um, Sanity Group or um, Kansativa here um, with the Snoop Dogg investment. Um, could, 
Could you lay a little bit the groundwork how this is currently working in Germany? At least the legal can cannabis business. I'm sure that's the only one you could talk about here. And then we try to put you in where you fit in, in terms of the value chain there. Um, so, um, the, the, as of now, there is only medical cannabis in, in Germany uh, and also all over Europe. Uh, there is no recreational market as of now. Um, as we, uh, as some of us may aware, uh, there, there's lots of talks about uh, recreational cannabis use, obviously in Germany, but also in the Czech Republic and Malta and wherever. But as of today, um, it's, it's rather a medical market. Um, those markets have been in existence for quite some time. Uh, they're here and they're, they're, they're growing. Um, by the way, that's why we um, are 100% focused on those medical markets as of today, because uh, there's ample, ample room uh, to grow and ample room uh, to make profits there. No need to think too much into the future about any recreational market, because in the here and now, there's, there's, uh, there is a market uh, where you can gain market share and make, make, make profits there. Um, in terms of the, the lay of the land, um, I'm currently looking at three archetypes in terms of um, companies being active in, in, in Europe. Uh, on the one hand, there are the vertical, vertically integrated players. Um, so doing basically from, from, from seed to sale, doing cultivation, manufacturing, uh, distribution, sales and marketing, all under one roof, um, mainly done by Canadian companies like my former company, Aurora, because they could raise, uh, yeah, billions of dollars uh, in order to build that infrastructure and, and, and build that um, value chain. Um, on the other hand, there are, um, we call them wholesalers or distributors, um, which are focusing on buying cannabis from somewhere in the world uh, and then basically just wholesale it to, to, to pharmacies, other wholesalers in Europe. And Cantourage is um, somewhere in the middle. Um, so we've initially, we focused on uh, manufacturing because that's the most challenging part from a regulatory perspective. Um, so it's so there's lots and lots of different cultivation assets around the world, uh, but they cannot supply any medical market because they're lacking uh, needed permits and licenses in order to turn an agricultural uh, agricultural good into a medicine. So therefore, you need to have certain permits and licenses to do the manufacturing, uh, the pharmaceutical manufacturing. That's what we focused on initially and took, took quite some time to get there. And now we have a special operating model where we focus on manufacturing and distribution, but we can source cannabis from around the world. Um, so the, the wholesalers we just talked about, they can they have access to a few um, cultivation manufacturing sites um, around the world, um, but that's about it. So mainly they, they are reliant on two or three different suppliers. Uh, and we built a special um, operating model where we source cannabis as a raw material from around the world. Currently, we have more than 65 cultivators out of 18 countries under contract. It basically, they send us uh, cannabis as a raw material, and then we do the manufacturing here in Germany and then uh, distribute it all over Europe. Um, as of today, we're selling in two, seven different European countries. Um, so basically you are also very early stage, um, in terms of growing, you don't do the growing by yourself, by contourage. You have, you have contractors to do that. Um, I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't call them contractors. We call them partners because right? at the end of the day, um, they're independent, uh, companies, um, and we have a special model in place, uh, where we share the achieved revenues here in Europe. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, we believe in partnerships and so everybody needs to eat along the value chain. Um, so we split the revenues we achieve here in Europe with our cultivation partners. Um, I, I mentioned before, so I, I work for Aurora, which is one of the vertically integrated players. Um, they invested heavily into that infrastructure. Uh, so it's a rather asset heavy um, operating model. And by choice, uh, we said, okay, um, we need to be nimble, we need to be agile, we need to be flexible. And there's lots and lots of good cultivation uh, partners around the world. No need to invest into that infrastructure. Let's rather be asset light, um, focus on manufacturing and distribution, and not invest heavily into cultivation assets. Um, because we can solve, solve that, that, that problem in terms of product supply by partnering with excellent growers around the world.
And the, 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 I did have a lot of questions here that I wrote down. Um, le, le, let me try to do first a little bit more the random ones and then, <laughs> then the ones that would drive the story further. Um, you were talking about Canada. Um, my understanding is that there are Canadian companies because they've been very early in the regulatory game. Um, because it, 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 at the point you were talking about, it kind of hit me that Canada is not necessarily the pre the place to grow cannabis. So there had to be a different driver here. Um, I mean, yeah, on the one hand, you could say, okay, from, from a, from a, um Climate perspective, there, there's there's better regions to actually grow cannabis around the equator. Um, that you could basically grow cannabis outdoors or in greenhouses where it's, uh, it's energy efficient and labor costs are relatively low, uh, especially compared to to the European Union. Um, but Canada uh, Canada was at the forefront in terms of the regulatory game, as you just mentioned. Um, so cannabis was fully legalized also for recreational use in 2019. And that led to the fact that uh, there was a massive market uh, and um, those companies were already public. They could raise lots and lots of, 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 of dollars in order to build an infrastructure. Um, yeah, and initially uh, in, in the early days of the, of the cannabis industry, um, people built cultivation assets where they could, not where it necessarily, necessarily made the most sense. And you were allowed basically to build cultivation assets in, in Canada. Uh, that's what they did. Uh, now you can see that from a cost perspective from time to time might, might make, makes more sense to build it somewhere else. But now the infrastructure there is, is there and needs to be, uh, yeah, needs to be used to a certain, to a certain degree. But I should also, before I forget, I should also mention, yeah. um, there, there are lots of excellent growers in Canada at the end of the day. Um, so there, there's, there's a, a legacy. Uh, there is uh, lots of experiences, lots of know-how. Um, so as of today, uh, I think the, 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 the best cannabis in terms of, 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 of quality um, that is available in, in Europe is basically imported uh, from Canada. So they are leading the pack, that's for sure. Uh, another curveball question is, when you were talking about all those capital markets events and so on, on and so forth, what went through my mind was, do you have a lot of guys from the ESG community that invest in you or does your business model violate their rules? Um, it depends. Um, it just recently we had a, a, a lengthy discussions with a potential investor that was really adamant about um, ESG and future ESG rules. Uh, where um, as of today, cannabis from time to time is, is an issue, uh, especially if, um, we talk about recreational cannabis. Um, so, uh, it depends in terms of the investment criteria. Uh, there is certain institutional investors who don't have any issue at all with cannabis. There are a few which are, do have issues, uh, and there are others which, um, do like Kantaraj because we're focusing on medical cannabis, uh, only as of today. Also, um, I would like to hint that, especially during the interview of Kansativa, we've talked about the, the dream of legalizing, as you already mentioned, cannabis here in Germany for recreation and use. I think they, they dreamed of a really, really big thing. And then a very, very small proposal came along, which apparently, um, shattered the dreams of some of the people there. Um, that, that, that's what would like. To keep it, I think you you would have a lot to say about that. Uh, yeah, I think um, so. Initially, there was. I mean, at the end of the day, let's talk about the the, the market potential first. Um, so Germany is by far the biggest medical market in in Europe. Um, and so we can talk roughly at twenty tons per year uh, currently being sold in Germany in terms of medical cannabis, and the conservative estimate of the the black market is roughly four hundred tons. So there is uh, a multiplier by 20 in terms of, of um, a potential market. So that's a huge, huge boost, huge upside for lots of cannabis companies. So that's why everybody was looking at a potential recreational market in Germany. There's lots and lots of potential. Um, 
But at the end of the day, um, so as, as of, we at Kantarash, um, we're active in the medical game. Uh, we're active in a lot of different European countries. So we didn't build the company based on, on a pipe dream that the recreational market might uh, happen soon or soonish. Um, we always looked at the development, um, also talked to, let's say, a few people involved um, in, in, in drafting that, that, that bill. But uh, we were never fully convinced that there will be a full legalization uh, within the next one or two years. Um, so usually regulators take their time. Uh, usually there is a pilot program. They evaluate the data before then really open uh, the, 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 the legalization of the floodgates. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's a good sign. It's, it's a phased approach step by step, uh, to warm up to the idea to, to fully legalize cannabis. Um, and we'll see how that goes in terms of recreational cannabis. Um, but we should also mention in that, in that, uh, proposal, people mostly talk about recreational cannabis, but there's also a, a major change for medical cannabis in Germany. Um, cause, um, it will no longer be treated as a narcotic. Uh, it's just an RX, so a prescription, um, a medicine that should actually help further, further grow, uh, medical cannabis in, in, in Germany. Um, cause it, it'll help, um, or it, it will ease the burden on, 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 on doctors and pharmacists um, to prescribe and dispense cannabis. So we rather see, um, rather a short term boost for the, for the medical, um, cannabis here in Germany. And in terms of recreational, um, given it's, it's home grow, given it's mostly for so-called cannabis clubs, you can't be active in those, uh, as a, as a cannabis company. There is no, um, this, yeah, limited potential, let's say for, for cannabis companies in the recreational uh, game. However, we rather see a boost in the medical game, given the reclassification of cannabis as a non-narcotic. Yes, uh, I do believe first, um, what is really important here is that, um, there is not a instant legalization and then the, the lawmakers realize, oh, we made a big problem and full speed backwards. That would be a big issue because then it would make it impossible on political terms for years and years to come to legalize this. So a more cautious approach is the better one here. And, and, and at the end of the day, yep. it's, to me, it's, uh, it's, it's also a German approach to do it like that. Um, so step by step, uh, it's a bit, bit of a wait and see approach, evaluate the data, uh, and then further, further, further improve the regulatory framework in order to, let's say, build, build a sustainable and, and, and long-term structure, uh, for, for, for companies, um, to engage in, in cannabis. So mm. I wasn't, I wasn't too surprised that it's a step by step approach. Yeah. And um, the, the thing that it's not regulated as narcotic would mean a lot because there's a very strict law here in Germany, Betäubungsmittel Gesetz, and you have to follow a lot of regulations. And if you don't, there are very harsh punishments involved. And that was would uh, reclassification out of this class would not necessarily um, make it easy, make it simple, but it would be uh, make it less regulated. And um, if you make mistakes, it's not as harsh as a punishment as it is in other classes. But l l let me get from the curveball question back to my original idea of the interview. You guys do manufacturing. So what I had in mind is uh, like you get delivered like big, big amounts of, um, in, in containers and climatized containers, um, with one or two security guys. And then it drives into a physical factory and there something happens. Is it like that? And do you do it in Germany? And how does all of this stuff work? Because that's the important part. Many people out there will never in their whole life have a chance to know how this is working. And if they really a little bit geeky and want to know how stuff works, that's their chance. So go ahead. <laughs> um, I mean, you, it's pretty, pretty accurate what, what you just described. Um, uh, so we basically import uh, the plant or we call it biomass or, or raw material um, in, into Germany, uh, actually into Frankfurt. And then it gets sent to our manufacturing hub, which is in Bavaria. And then basically we turn that agricultural good into a medicine. And that means uh, drying, 
uh, trimming um, needs also reducing the micro but microbiological load uh, it's uh, packaging it's labeling it's testing so there's lots and lots of different steps from a pharmaceutical perspective in order to have um, a safe product at the end of the day um, so it's it's a lot of work <laughs> So it's, it's, it's not that simple, uh, many pharmaceutical manufacturing, um, but we do that all, all in Germany and then also send it from, from, from our hub here in Germany, um, all over Europe, uh, different, different products. I see, see. And, and that, that's also the part that makes you really different. You are importing, you are making it ready as a medical pro product as you said microbiological loads you don't want to have a lot of viruses or bacteria on it i think you cannot completely cleanse it because it, it's a natural product but you'll have to you reduce this load by a considerable amount i'm sure uh, yeah so there is um so in terms of um so at the end of the day it's a medicine um so there's mm -hmm. a tight regulation also in terms of different levels of um, contamination um, and uh, so we need to comply to those rules and want to comply to, to those rules uh, and so we came up with a rather unique and innovative method to reduce the microbiological load uh, most of our peers use irradiation um, so either gamma irradiation or e-beaming um, and we came up with a new um Yeah, innovative method, which is a bit more gentle to the product, which is, is we call it smooth. Um, because at the end of the day, um, it's a natural product with natural ingredients. And to me, it sounds counterintuitive to use radioactive sources in order to treat the product. So we have um, a new method, uh, which reduces the microbiotic load um, as needed and is rather gentle to the product so we can preserve um, terpenes and other um, active ingredients um, in, in the product. Um, and so far, feedback from patients and, and, and doctors is, is pretty good in terms of our product. And then you also have a platform on which the wholesalers and maybe even the pharmacies can directly order? Uh, yeah, that's correct. Uh, so um, we... We, we call it a, a platform, basically, which is uh, connecting our product portfolio to um, uh, other wholesalers and or pharmacies. Uh, so if they want to, they can directly order product um, via our platform um, or uh, what they call us up here. So um, honestly speaking, um, most of the pharmacies in Germany um, are not yet fully immersed in, in, in the digital digital space. Um, so we, there's lots of communication via, via email, also via phone. Um, but we try to, to, to also offer uh, a fully digitized experience for pharmacies. So if they choose to, they can um, also use our platform to, to order products. And I've seen in one of your presentation, you claim around 80% of the market for medical cannabis. Does this mean you import something like 80% of the product there? Um, it's, it's not hundred percent accurate. Um, um, in terms of different product formats, uh, there are, um, let's say, For, for, for monograss, uh, how you can dispense cannabis as a compound medicine. So there is a dried flower, there is dronavinol, there is um, extracts or oils, and mm -hmm. uh, pharmaceutical CBD. Um, and the, the last component is, is as finished products. And we are currently um, engaged in four product formats. Uh, so we are dispensing flower, dronavinol, um, extracts, and CBD. Um, mm -hmm. most of our competitors are only active in one or two product formats and, um, yeah, we're active in, in four different product formats or four monographs. And that's roughly 80% of the market. So our total addressable market is 80%, uh, because we're not active in, in finished products. I see. I see. This is where we're going. Um, usually I close the interview with two questions. Um, but, um, apparently everybody who'd like to invest in your company can do so via the Frankfurt Stock Exchange. You're traded there daily. So, um, 
all the investors can go there. Um, um, but usually I have the last question. Are you looking for talent? And what we usually do is the people already listen to the interview. They know you guys by now. And, uh, what, what they then do is, uh, looking at the careers website. So I would suggest we link the careers website because every company is currently is really looking for talent, right? Uh, that's for sure. Um, always always on the lookout for uh, the best talent available out there um, and so we are located in Berlin and Bavaria but also looking for for, for talents basically all around Europe um, we have uh, so most of our operations is in Germany but we also have a subsidiary in in, in the UK based in London uh, where we also if not the leader one of the leaders in terms of medical cannabis uh, so feel free to to check out our careers website also check out uh, opportunities all around europe um, so kandaraj is growing these days and so we're also hiring new 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 talents mm -hmm. and, and everybody who'd like to learn more they can go down here in the show notes there will be a link to your linkedin profile of course there will be a link to your company website and your career website where people can have a look around. Um, Philip, it was a pleasure talking to you. Um, I learned a lot personally today, um, not only about the role of Canada in growing cannabis. <laughs> and um, I really enjoyed the interview and I hope to have you back in some time. Cool. Thanks for having me. It was lots of fun. Thank you. My pleasure. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. That's all, folks. Find more news, streams, events, and interviews at www.startuprad.io. Remember, sharing is caring.